from here, I'd like to, to segue into our first panel for uh, this year's conference relating to topics in election law and integrity. And from here, I will turn this over to the panel's moderator, UK law professor, Brian Fry. Hey, thanks so much, Tom. So uh, I'll, be, I'll, I'll be very brief here. Uh, uh, two things, one for the panelists. Uh, you'll have each 10 minutes to speak. I'll put you on the timer. And uh, in, the ta in my uh, video tab here, I'll go ahead and up, hold up fi uh, five fingers at five minutes and one minute at one, uh, when, you're, uh, when you're one minute and zero, when it's time for you to stop speaking. And please try to hold to the 10 minutes because we have a limited amount of time. For, uh, for guests, uh, please ask any questions you have in the Q&A box in Zoom. And uh, because I have to jump off the call at uh, 12.50 your time, uh, those questions will be posed to the panelists by, by Tom Travis. Uh, so with no further ado, I will introduce our three panelists and then they will speak in turn. Uh, so the first panelist will be Kentucky Secretary of State Michael G. Adams. He is a graduate of Harvard Law School and was general counsel for the Republican Governors Association and a member of the Kentucky Board of Elections before becoming the Secretary of State, among many other things. Uh, the second panelist will be Jessica First Johnston. She, Johnson. She is a partner at Holtman Vogel Josephiak Tochinsky PLLC. Uh, she's a graduate of the University of Florida Levin School of Law and has served as general counsel to the National Republican Congressional Committee, among many other things. Uh, and the final panelist will be Dr. Rachel Kleinfeld. She's a graduate of Yale University and a Rhodes Scholar at uh, Oxford University. And she's currently a senior, uh, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where she is a leading expert on democracy. So welcome to all of our panelists. And we will begin with Secretary of State Michael Adams. Thank you so much, uh, Professor, and thank all of you for being uh, with us today. It's a great honor uh, to speak uh, following the Attorney General. He's been the best partner I have here in state government. Uh, I certainly get a lot of attention for working with our Democratic governor, but I also work closely with our Attorney General, uh, actually far more closely uh, with him every day uh, on various things, including ballot integrity, and he's been uh, an outstanding uh, partner, and I'm really grateful for him. So. Uh, my background, uh, as some of you know, is I actually was an election attorney uh, in private practice, uh, a national practice uh, based in uh, D.C., representing everyone from uh, the vice president to uh, the Republican Governors Association, other national committees. I've done uh, campaign work in all 50 states, and that actually was a pretty good, uh, pretty good preparation uh, for what I've come into this year, uh, my first year in office. Uh, as a rookie Secretary of State, uh, Chief Election Official in Kentucky, I'm now running elections in a pandemic. Talk about hazing the new guy. Uh, there's a lot to learn here and not much charted waters. And so I'm, I'm really glad that I've had the experience that I've had uh, before coming into this office uh, to be at least somewhat prepared uh, for this experience. I ran on a platform of making it easy to vote and hard to cheat. I meant both parts of that uh, sincerely. And I don't think I'd be in this position if I hadn't promised to do both of those things. Uh, certainly to comfort Kentuckians who are concerned about uh, vote suppression, vote fraud, you got to be bipartisan. You have to reach out to everybody. Uh, certainly uh, running on policy, making my election last year a referendum on policy is why I went from 15 points down uh, to win comfortably, uh, carrying 107 counties. Uh, but I didn't just win on, on uh, photo ID and other ballot integrity uh, issues. I went on promising to be fair and neutral and objective and to make it easy to vote. I personally know a lot of Democrats who voted uh, for uh, Democrats in other offices but voted for me for this. And I work for them just as hard as I work uh, for all the conservatives who voted for me. Uh, I don't think that voting should be a partisan or an ideological issue. Uh, there's plenty of voters on both sides that want to vote. And they want it to be as easy and convenient as possible within reason. And so I, I've never really thought that voting is a liberal issue uh, or a conservative issue. It's for everybody. Uh, the things I ran on uh, primarily, uh, my big picture promise was to uh, enhance Kentuckians' faith in our election system. A year ago, the things I thought I needed to do and I said that I would do were, were number one, uh, restore personal integrity to this office after years and years of scandal. Uh, number two, to uh, push a photo ID to vote law, which I successfully did. Uh, number three, to clean up our voter rolls. 
I talked in my campaign about how we had some 200,000 voters on our voter rolls who had either moved away or passed away or been put away, and yet they persisted in remaining on our voter rolls. The last Secretary of State to clean up our rolls was Trey Grayson in 2009. Uh, we had two secretaries uh, in between uh, Trey Grayson and me who didn't lift a finger to stay into legal compliance and got their uh, hands wrapped by a federal judge. Uh, so I've been working on that. Uh, we've got a great story to tell on all the tens of thousands of dead voters alone that we've gotten off of our voter rolls. Those are the things I promised to do and, and I've done uh, every single one of them in the nine months I've been here. Uh, but of course, the biggest thing I've had to deal with is making vote, making elections uh, safe and secure in the context of a pandemic. And I think that's really certainly defined my first year and made define uh, my entire term in office. Uh, I, I think uh, you have to see all these things kind of wrapped together. Uh, I don't think I would have had the credibility or the reputation to make it easier to vote if I hadn't made it harder to cheat. I don't think the public would have accepted the expansion of voting access that I've made uh, possible. Uh, and I don't think that the voters would have confidence in our system. Uh, so these things are really tied together. I think if you just focus on making it easy to vote without the protocols in place to make it hard to cheat, then you won't have the credibility to actually get it done. Same thing if you just make it harder to vote and don't make it easier to vote, uh, then you've got that problem too. You gotta do both at the same time. So this year before the pandemic, I offered legislation, a hard to cheat bill and an easy to vote bill. Uh, the hard to cheat bill uh, passed fairly easily and is the law, but I also offered an easy to vote bill. It was cleared for passage and then unfortunately uh, in the context of the pandemic, our legislative session was aborted and so I'll have to come back in the future uh, with legislation. Uh, but I was able to fortunately get a lot of that done administratively. The governor and I concluded pretty early on that we needed to make changes to our system to provide for safe voting in a pandemic atmosphere. Our legislature, unlike a lot of legislatures, uh, is part-time and adjourns, uh, constitutionally has to adjourn by the 15th of April. Uh, so we had to be flexible and unfortunately the legislature couldn't pass a new election code. So they, at my request, gave the governor and me the authority uh, to rewrite some things. And so the governor and I have done that. We worked in a bipartisan way. I think that was good for our system, uh, having both a D and an R working together. That way the voters knew the rules were fair. It also meant that we were able to work things out in advance so we could inform the electorate and train our election officials on how to do things differently. Uh, the biggest thing that we changed was expanding absentee voting. Again, this is not permanent. This is uh, on a temporary emergency basis. We expanded absentee voting. I'm not a fan generally of no excuse uh, absentee, uh, but in the context of trying to avoid crowds and people needing to remain at home, certainly in the context of the primary, it was important to expand absentee voting, but we did it in a way that ensured ballot integrity. Uh, we set up a new uh, online portal at govoky.com where voters could get their uh, ballot application in. We don't just mail out ballots to the phone book like in some states. And we use this mechanism to proactively verify voters' identity. I've been voting absentee since my first election in 1994. I just called or emailed and then they sent me a ballot. Now you actually have to prove your identity with, with uh, personal identifiable information and we actually pull your driver's license and verify your identity. We also have barcode tracking on the ballot envelopes so we can monitor these uh, ballots from Frankfurt. Uh, the Attorney General and I work together with a ballot integrity task force to surveil the election. We can know in fairly real time if an address has requested multiple ballots. We can track these and see if we've got lost or missing or stolen ballots. We've never had that before. So as, as long as you're providing for uh, integrity in the process, people are actually pretty accepting of changes that you make that expand the franchise. But again, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. You can't do one without the other. We also vigorously check signatures on absentee ballots to make sure that we don't have someone stealing someone else's vote. But we now have a cure process that we've implemented administratively uh, to help reach out to voters whose signatures don't match or who make some other uh, fatal error on their ballot, like not sealing the envelope, to reach out to them and give them a chance to cure their error so their vote isn't thrown out. That also gives me the ability to see if someone signs a ballot and then doesn't, uh, it doesn't match, and then we can potentially track that person down and if it's a fraudulent situation. So it actually helps us on the integrity side and on the voter access side. Another thing that we've done is uh, utilizing drop boxes. 
Uh, these are for the benefit of voters who choose not to mail back an absentee ballot. They actually save us on the postage. <laughs> We're spending $4 million on postage for the general election alone this year and about $300,000 on drop boxes. Uh, for every, every ballot that's returned by Dropbox, we save about a, a buck and a half. That adds up. Uh, but we're not doing it for money. We're doing it for voter confidence. Uh, we're doing it so we don't overload the postal system. Uh, we're doing it so voters of both parties who have concerns about the post office can safely uh, drop their ballots off and know they've been received. I was very uh, politically dubious of offering drop boxes in the primary. I thought I'd get my head taken off uh, the way I did on expanding absentee voting. Uh, but I really didn't. It was actually Republicans more than Democrats who liked the drop boxes. The Republicans are more uh, dubious of the post office than Democrats, uh, and they're the ones who have utilized these drop boxes uh, primarily. So we've made these available. They've been really popular. In some states, these are more of a loaded uh, political issue, but in Kentucky, we really haven't had any of that. Uh, and finally, the other thing that we did is we expanded in-person voting. Uh, we expanded it not just in terms of locations uh, from our primary, but we've also added more days. To help ensure social distancing, we now have 19 election days for in-person voting instead of just one. Uh, we have a model in our state constitution. We have everybody vote on one day in a 12-hour span. Uh, that was set during an agrarian era in the 1800s, and it doesn't reflect modern reality, but it certainly doesn't in a pandemic situation. So that's why we've got 19 days of early in-person voting. Most voters in Kentucky, Democrats and Republicans, want to vote in person. That's just our culture. So we've made that possible. My expectation is 30% of our voters will vote uh, absentee ballot in the general election. 70% will vote in person over a span of 19 days. And we'll see how this impacts the results. I'm not really believing that it will. I think the results are going to be the results uh, regardless. And the people that were leading before are going to went on election day uh, in most cases. Uh, I don't think that the model of the election should dictate the results. I think the interests of voters should dictate the results. And so despite some, some unfortunate uh, backlash from some politicians uh, in Frankfurt, I think the voters know they're first and they're pretty happy with that. Thanks so much. Great. So our next speaker will be Jessica First Johnston. And just a reminder for uh, the audience that you can ask questions of any of the panelists via the Q&A box. And the questions will be posed to the panelists collectively at the end of the panel. Great. Thank you, Professor. And um, it's such a pleasure to join you all uh, today to discuss um, what has um, consumed my life for the last, uh, you know, five or six months, um, and somewhat unexpectedly. Um, first, you know, I just must say um, thank you, Secretary, for your remarks. Um, I've had the pleasure of working um, with Secretary Adams on several clients over the years, and um, y'all are just um, in very good hands and should be very grateful and thankful for um, the work that he does on your behalf in Kentucky, because I can tell you um, and if you've read, you know, any relevant publication over the last few months, you've probably sensed for yourself that things are not um, well taken care of in other states um, like he's just laid out for you in Kentucky. So you're very lucky. Um, my practice in campaign finance and election law is a bit more nationalized. So I was planning to spend a little bit of time with you today talking about some of the frequent claims that we're seeing across the country and why the outcome of the relevant cases is important to this election cycle um, and future election cycles. So just as a, um, as a place setter, the standard, the Stanford uh, MIT Healthy Elections Tracker, which um, has been tracking the COVID-related election and campaign finance law cases that we've seen pop up. Um, as of yesterday, they were counting 365 cases related to COVID in the election cycle across 44 states. Uh, I, I'm sure that that's already outdated. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm also certain that um, something that I'm going to say to you over the next 10 minutes is probably also outdated because things are just changing momentarily in this area, um, which makes for a very exciting, but also very confusing um, time. So we're seeing, you know, we see litigation every cycle. Um, this, this volume is certainly unprecedented. And I think something else to consider is that we're heading into a redistricting cycle uh, in 2020. So, you know, the litigation um, is only going to increase, frankly, and, and we're really uh, settling in for quite the one-two punch here. Um, but as a result of the litigation, we're seeing the legislation, that's been passed um, in the election law context and various governor's orders and directives across the country, 
we're really seeing changes in nearly every state regarding the electoral process. And these changes will inevitably result in errors, you know, made at the polling place, during canvassing, during election board meetings. Um, Secretary of State um, Kim Wyman in Washington state, she said it took her state about five years to prepare to transition to an all male election process. So, you know, here we are expecting folks, uh, elections officials, most times very well meaning officials, to be able to competently and efficiently transfer their process either to an all male process or a um, sufficiently all male process within a matter of months, it, that expectation is just wholly unrealistic. Um, and these errors that, that are sure to come are going to form the factual basis for the litigation that will be filed to challenge the outcome of the elections if uh, the, the political outcome doesn't meet the approval of the would-be plaintiffs. So um, buckle in, it, it's gonna be a very um, interesting ride with this vicious cycle, you know, file litigation, change the rules of the game, watch the errors pile up, cite errors and new filings under state law um, and contest and challenge proceedings and, um, and you know, get ready. So it's, it's going to be a wild ride. Um, but 20 days out from the election, you know, what can we do? I think it's really important to, to think about pushing back on the unconstitutional overreach um, of persons other than state legislators. And, and I think that folks um, are really doing a good job of, of attempting to do that across the country. Um, I don't need to tell this group, I'm sure, but you know, the Constitution in the Elections Clause, Article 1, Section 4, Clause 1, delegates to state legislators the time, manner, and place of holding elections for U.S. Senators and Congressmen, noting that, of course, Congress can make any law or alter such regulation except, um, obviously, with respect to the place of senatorial elections. That, that, that's obviously set. But the originalist perspective here is that the state legislators are charged with making determinations about how these elections will be held. Not judges, not governors, certainly not political consultants. Um, yet that's exactly what we're seeing across the country. Uh, in a con concurring opinion that was issued um, earlier this month in, in Dino versus Middleton, which we'll discuss in more detail in a moment, um, Justice Kavanaugh stated, quote, a state legislature's decision either to keep or to make changes to election rules to address COVID-19 ordinarily should not be subject to second guessing by an unelected federal judiciary, which lacks the background, competence, and expertise to assess public health and is not accountable to the people. He continued to state that federal courts ordinarily should not alter state election rules in the period close to an election. And, and this has been known um, for you know, over a decade now as the Purcell principle, uh, something that's you know, becoming very relevant in all of these cases we're seeing. So we're gonna continue to see this fight play out in courtrooms across the country because the lawsuits are, are frankly just not stopping. And I would commend to you a quick visit to Democracy Docket um, if you want to see what the left's plans are for the courtroom. Um, they, they spell that out very well there. Um, and I wanted to take a moment here to briefly review with you some of the specific major issues that we're seeing crop up in these cases um, and, and that you'll continue to hear about over the next um, certainly more than 20 days. Um, the first is these ballot receipt deadline issues. We're seeing case after case filed here um, to either extend the date of a required receipt of mail-in ballots or to permit ballots to be postmarked by a certain date instead of received by elections officials in hand on that date. And this was the issue um, before the Supreme Court in the spring decision in uh, our related election law case that we saw, um, where the Supreme Court blocked a district court ruling uh, one day before Wisconsin's April primary election um, that had extended the deadline for submitting absentee ballots. So the ma majority relied on the Purcell principle there to say that the changing of the date of the receipt for absentee ballots so close to an election would fundamentally alter the nature of the election. Now, RBG, in her dissent, said that the proper application of the Purcell principle would caution against the Supreme Court even taking the case in the first place. Um, so here we see the tension between the changes that are considered necessary in light of the pandemic, which as the secretary you know, noted, certainly there are changes that are necessary, but at the same time upholding state law regarding elections and respecting the constitution's deference to state legislatures on this issue. Um, I have to note that one of the biggest federal cases pending here in this area is the Pennsylvania Supreme Court decision that extended 
extended the deadline for mail-in ballots to arrive um, at election offices to three days after the close of in-person voting. We're, we're waiting um, to hear what SCOTUS has to say on this and, and frankly accepting, expecting to hear something any moment. Um, another area is um, rules as to who may vote by absentee ballot. Prior to the pandemic, man, many states required an excuse to vote by absentee ballot. As of today, there's only five states that require an excuse, Indiana, Louisiana, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Texas. This was the issue in Texas Democratic Party versus Abbott, where um, the Supreme Court was petitioned to reinstate pending appeal, a ruling by a federal district court that would allow all eligible voters in Texas to vote by mail in 2020, as opposed to just the um, folks that are 65 and older who in Texas can vote without an excuse. Um, given that we have five states that are now mailing ballots to every single registered voter, and and given that 23 states have made changes to their election law um, in light of COVID, you can really expect this to be a hot button issue, not just now, but for years to come, I think, as we um, evaluate kind of what went wrong and right after 2020. Um, two more areas to briefly note, witness notarization requirements, certainly a hot button issue here. This was specifically an issue in the Supreme Court's Andino case that I mentioned earlier. Um, that was a case coming out of South Carolina where the issue was whether to enforce the requirement that mail-in ballots be verified by a signature in the presence of another individual uh, um, or a witness in light of the coronavirus. Um, again, a case decided with reference to the Purcell principle, which is generally accepted as a rationale that courts should not change election rules during a period of time just before an election because doing so could certainly confuse voters, create problems for officials administering the election, which is certainly what we're seeing across the country now. Um, last week, the Missouri Supreme Court heard a similar case regarding whether notarization requirements should be upheld, so that will be certainly interesting to follow. Um, last issue to point out is ballot harvesting. This is the practice of um, an individual who's not the voter collecting the ballot from the individual and returning it to elections officials. Um, this issue is arising in, in the course of drop boxes in California currently. If you Google ballot harvesting California, you're going to see lots of information about drop boxes, which are um, slightly more contentious than, than it seems like Secretary Adams has been able to um, implement in Kentucky. But the Supreme Court is also scheduled to hear this term, a case called Bronovich versus DNC, which comes out of Arizona, um, where the ballot harvesting um, rule that severely restricted this practice was overruled by a lower court. And so we're really looking forward to hearing what the Supreme Court has to say after they hear about this. Um, just to close, I would say all of this is incredibly important because if we hearken back to Bush v. Gore, you know, the two deadlines that were really important in that case um, were the deadline th this year, it's December 8th, which is the date that states have to certify their results or, ha or have the state legislature appoint electors to the Electoral College, um, which is set to convene on December 14th, the second important date. So failing to meet these deadlines could lead to further litigation or even Congress choosing the president, which again in Bush v. Gore, so, you know, the Florida um, Secretary of State said was really important for her um, deciding to stop the recount. So gosh, lots to watch. Um, it's a fun ride and I look forward to continuing to watch it alongside y'all. Thanks for having me. Wonderful. Thanks so much. And our third panelist will be Dr. Rachel Kleinfeld. Thank you. I'm aware I'm cleanup hitter here, so I will uh, try to try to serve that role. Um, so we're, we're on a panel on election law and integrity, and I want to start with the second half of that because one of the things that we see, I'm an international I look at democracies comparatively, and it used to be that all my work was abroad. We did work on uh, the rule of law and building democracy in other countries. My books were about building the rule of law and looked at the U.S. as the beacon that built the rule of law in other countries or helped them build it. Now, about 90% of my work is within America um, as of this election cycle, and that's not good. And that's largely because trust is eroding. It's eroding between Americans and between Americans and our government. And what you see um, with these historic levels of low trust, trust in America is now at about 17%. And when you, that's a Pew Research number. And trust in America has been something that Americans have been lauded for since de Tocqueville. Trust allows us to do things that other societies haven't been able to do. It allows our commerce to function. It allows our government to function. Um, when you have more trust, your GDP goes up. There's all sorts of high correlates with trust because when you have trust, you resort to law less and there's less friction in the system. Our trust is our society's immune system. And as it is destroyed, 
and is reduced, everything becomes more difficult. Everything needs to be written down. Everything needs to be dotted I's and cross T's. And I recognize I'm speaking to a room full of lawyers here, but um, it, it is uh, really quite significant because without trust, you get more law. And the problem in US democracy is that our laws in this area are actually quite thin. And most of our democracy in the area of elections is at state law levels and at the federal level, it's built on norms. We, our laws in the federal level often come from the reconstruction era. They're quite poorly written, they're very murky and they can be interpreted in many different ways. And so once you get to the situation Jessica is talking about where Congress is starting to litigate who's president or what have you, you've already lost. Our democracy is already lost regardless of who wins. And um, this is a real problem given the level of anticipated legislation, the legislation we've already seen and what we're already seeing. You don't need me to go over it. Jessica has just gone over much of what we're already seeing. Um, but one of the things I want to highlight from Jessica's list is just how much it means that voters in different states actually are facing uh, such different systems as to be operating in almost different republics. Now, in a part, that's our federalist system. That's how it's supposed to be. But when you have, for instance, one drop box in Houston that 5 million people have to use or more than 5 million people have to use and laws in Texas that make it a felony to drop off someone else's vote. So if you say, hey, honey, you're going to that drop box, you're gonna be waiting in your car for a couple hours to get to that drop box, can you drop off my vote? You might have just committed a felony. That's a very different situation than uh, in a state in which Kentucky, for instance, in which your Secretary of State has made this a very easy, simple process. I used to live in Colorado, mail-in voting had been a thing there for years. It's a very simple activity. I now live in New Mexico, where the um, mail from certain uh, tribal areas, similar to Arizona, can take 10 days to reach the, from the tribal area into um, a ballot. So, Voters in America are now facing such disparate city uh, systems that it's actually deeply affecting how our democracy itself functions. It also is affecting how internationals are viewing our democracy. And I wanna come back to that at the end because how the globe is viewing our democracy has effects for American power. Now, one of the main areas I work in is violence. I work on conflict overseas and I work on violence here. And since Jessica has so beautifully covered all of the nonviolent challenges to our election, that will be the area I focus on. We're worried about two forms of violence. One is election day violence or intimidation. And intimidation can cover a broad range of things that are not actually violent. So threatening, coercing, attempting to intimidate, um, all sorts of activities within the zones that states describe, uh, whether it's 75 feet, 100 feet, 150 feet, from a polling area. Um, there are already a number of cases of uh, attempts to interfere with the vote coming out of multiple states. Um, and there's some very serious fines for uh, doing that kind of intimidation in different states. And certain states such as Philadelphia after the last presidential debate have been developing really strong plans for, with law enforcement to take very seriously in this cycle, this issue of intimidation. That's because uh, violence in America has been on the, on the uptick over the um, last year. We're still at very low levels, I should say. We're at 1961 levels of violence in America. That's extremely low, and that's a very good thing. But what we're seeing is political violence rising um, quite significantly and acceptance of violence rising. And so what you see is that here in Kentucky, your attorney general has already been armed with a security detail. Um, that's going to continue, I believe, through election day, possibly afterward, depending on how, um, how things go. Um, that's not comfortable. My father's a federal judge, now an appellate court judge. There were times when we had security details. It affects family life. It affects the, who runs for public office. You don't want a democracy where that's necessary. Mexico is a democracy where that's necessary, not our country. We've had a spike in death threats to health officials. We've had 71% of Americans, according to a more in common poll, worried about political violence. More in common is a global organization that works on depolarizing in um, many different countries. And our best political scientists actually wrote an article two weeks ago 
pulling together all of their data sets. Now, political scientists don't do this. They guard their data sets very carefully. This is their bread and butter. That's how they make their careers. They were so worried about the issue of violence that they pulled all their data sets together to compare notes. And what they found was that about one in three Americans are now claiming that just violence is at least somewhat justified to advance political goals. About one in five on either side, and the numbers are actually quite similar on both sides of the partisan divide, are saying that violence is justified a lot or a great deal if their side loses. And close to three in four feel that the longer we have to wait for results, the more likely it is that fraud is the reason. That's particularly concerning because certain swing states can't even start can't counting absentee ballots until the night of election. And in those swing states, it, it's extraordinarily unlikely that we'll have a result on election night. Um, it's just not possible given the number of absentee ballots that can be expected this year. Parties can disagree in democracies. That's what they are supposed to do. We are supposed to have strong conservative and liberal parties that represent voters. But when they begin to accept violence, your republic falls apart. And when partisans of both parties accept violence, the leaders have to step in. There's a lot of psychological research on how leaders can denormalize violence. Normalization of violence is what it allows it to spread from fringes, which is where it is now, let me be clear, it's right now on the fringes, to the mainstream. And while partisans of both parties are becoming much more accepting of violence, leaders are actually quite lopsided in what they've said about it. So you've had much more speaking out on property violence and on personal violence on the Democratic than on the Republican side. And I really hope that changes because violence is something that no one benefits from on either side. We also need to talk about violence on the governmental side and the use of, of governmental forms of violence. Of course, the Constitution um, reserves to Congress the power to legislate how militias can be employed domestically. That's the militia clause in Article One, and the legislative power related to this obligation in the Constitution, it imposes on the US a guarantee that states are protected against invasion and that the Congress is the ultimate arbiter of this. The president's lawful authority to deploy troops for domestic law enforcement is very limited. It's constitutionally limited, except in instances where Congress prescribes it. And we also see a similar um, type of, of constraint on overuse of governmental power from the Posse Comitatus Act from 1878. As I said, a lot of this law comes from the Reconstruction era. Um, that's a criminal law. So anyone, whether it's a politician or a uh, military actor or uh, actor from um, the, the uh, general public who willfully tried to use the army or air force as a posse comitatus, as an auxiliary of law enforcement, or otherwise to execute laws, um, except in cases where Congress has authorized it, um, it, it commits a criminal act and can be prosecuted. That has not been used in the past, but there are now an army of lawyers uh, looking at, at using that. It's similarly illegal for uh, federal law enforcement to interfere with elections in any way, and almost every state has very strong laws against legal interference with elections. And of course, at the national level, we do have laws about deploying to the polls and so on. This will all get quite messy if we see citizens acting to upset the polls and the government needing to balance the rule of law and its law enforcement functions against the need to not interfere with elections. And the worst case scenario is when all those things come together on election day and get in the way of regular Americans casting a ballot in a safe election. Um, that they should all deserve. Um, and I will close by going back to the international sphere, which is what I'd started uh, talking about earlier. I serve on the board of Freedom House. And one of the things that we're worried about at Freedom House is the, the precipitous drop in America's stature right now. That stature is tied to the handling of the COVID response. It's tied to presidential uh, leadership. It always is, and it fluctuates quite a bit. But we have never seen in the 20th century a drop this uh, speedy and this significant. To give you a sense, the UK, our closest ally for many, many years, our mother country, only 41% of British citizens now claim to admire America. Um, that's not good. That's, our, that's also the um, second largest allied military force. And that becomes an issue because the US is not only falling behind in, in stature with Western Europe and so on, it's also Russia that it's falling behind. It's also China. Now, 
Um, China, of course, has imprisoned billions of people in concentration camps. It runs a totalitarian surveillance system. For the U.S. to be falling behind in stature from China has something to say about what people are seeing on their televisions about our ability to solve our own problems, our ability to overcome our partisan differences, our polarization on many things, and just do the things that America used to do. My daughter, who's five years old, loves space, and I was just reading to her uh, before getting on this call, a book about sending a man to the moon and how we were the first and, and so on, and talking to her about the things that America has done and how we were able to do them. And getting back to that is intimately tied with how we run our elections and how those elections are seen in the eyes of the world, how safe they're seen, and how much they seem to be decided by the people who vote and not by the judges, the representatives, or the people who are deciding after the fact picking their voters. Um, thank you very much. Thank you to all the panelists. And I will now turn the Q&A session over to Tom Travis. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you, Professor Fry. Um, just a, a, another reminder to everyone that if you have questions, uh, please go ahead and enter those into the Q&A portion of, of the Zoom call. We, we have one or two already, um, but, but feel free to use that function. Um, the first question I, ex I have, I, I, I recall during uh, Ms. Johnson's remarks, uh, some discussion about the Supreme Court taking up the Pennsylvania Supreme Court case and the, the three-day post-election deadline to receive the absentee ballots. And, please, and this is directed at Secretary Adams. Um, please correct me if I, I'm misstating Kentucky's protocols here, but I, I want to say we have a similar three-day receipt rule to, to what Pennsylvania has. And if that's correct, do you have any thoughts on the case before the court? Well, uh, full disclosure, my law firm is actually in that case, uh, so I'll be really delicate uh, what I say. But let me, let me put it this way. I agree with Jessica's point that the laws should be made by the lawmakers. And in Kentucky's case, uh, the lawmakers delegated authority to the executive branch to make decisions, but in no respect should the courts make our election laws. Uh, there's lots of problems with that in terms of institutional competence, but if you wanna find a way for the public to not have confidence in the system, take the authority away from the people they elected and give it to the people who haven't been elected. Uh, I've been sued 14 times in this job, uh, and those lawsuits we've all won uh, or they're pending, uh, and I'm really pleased at that because I think this should be my decision in the governors and legislatures, uh, not judges. With respect to Pennsylvania, uh, their law provides for election day to be the deadline to receive an absentee ballot. It's actually what Kentucky law provides for as well. Uh, the reason that we're able to wait for three days afterward for ballots to be returned uh, that are voted on election day and mailed that day is because of emergency powers the governor and I utilized to extend that receipt deadline. In other words, this was done through a democratic process in a bipartisan way. It wasn't done by a court. Here's the big problem with Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court actually went so far as to say, even if the ballots are not postmarked and they're received days after the election, they must be counted. In my view, that violates the supremacy clause of the federal constitution, which sets forth an election day. You can't have ballots cast after election day. Under that court decision, a ballot could be received days after the election with no indicia that it was timely cast on or before election day. So that's really problematic. It's a, it's a reason that the court may well take the case. Thanks. Um, the, the next question uh, posed on the Q&A section uh, by John, it, this isn't directed to any particular panelist, so, so it's open for everyone. Uh, it, it's asking for, for commentary on the question of whether Amy Coney Barrett must or should recuse herself from any post-election litigation involving President Trump, assuming that she's confirmed, of course. I'm happy to take a stab at it. You know, um, I think her answer actually to this question when she was asked was really well stated. You know, that, that it, this is governed by statute. Um, it's also, you know, as she stated, um, 
historically something that the justices decide together. Um, and so, you know, like every other question she's getting asked through this process, you know, it really does seem quite hypothetical at this point. Um, and she, you know, answered by saying that, you know, when, when this is presented to her, that she, you know, would not be able to make a decision without consulting with the other justices. But, you know, I think it's also important to, to say that um, I think she's specifically been asked with respect to the Affordable Care Act, obviously, that's likely to be before the court, um, should she be appointed. And um, she noted that, you know, she did make these remarks in 2012, when there was a case uh, also about the Affordable Care Act before the bench. But, you know, that was specifically with respect, as I recall, to um, whether the, the um, individual mandate was to be treated as a tax. So, you know, there was a very narrow issue there before the court, which is not um, the issue that would be before the court in the current case. And so, you know, it really does, to me, seem at least to be... Um, a political charade that you're seeing from the Democrat senators that are asking because it, it's really not, I, I think, um, an issue that's, you know, likely to uh, require recusal unless, of course, she agrees with her, you know, the other justices as she stated. Okay, great. Assuming there's no other commentary, we, we have one other question on uh, the Q and A here. Uh, from an anonymous attendee directed to Dr. Kleinfeld asking for, and, and I don't totally re recall exactly what you said on this earlier, uh, as to why you say that the, the political left has condemned violence more than the right, and it looks like the, the rest of this question uh, discusses what is perceived to be a, uh, a disparate level of, of political violence one way or another uh, over the last several months. Um, so I'll just pose that generally to you and, uh, and feel free to, to comment on that. Sure, absolutely. And I was actually typing a comment back because there's some uh, sites that might be useful, but I'm having trouble uh, getting one of the links to work. So let me see if I can do that so that you'll have those links at the same time that I'm speaking. Um, I will get it to happen as soon as I finish speaking. Uh, anyway, this is simply, um, this is an incredibly fraught issue. So let me start by saying that. There, there is no way uh, within the motivated cognition that partisans have on both sides, a way to prove this point. Um, those who are on the left are going to feel that the right has not condemned enough. Those who are on the right are going to feel that the left has condemned enough. And since you would need to aggregate every statement made by every leader at every level from uh, church and synagogue to president and presidential candidate in order to prove the point, oh, uh, someone just erased all the things that I've been typing, that's unfortunate. Um, well, uh, since there's no way to prove the point, um, I'm not going to try to. What I will direct you to is what I had been typing, which is that, uh, ACLID, the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Monitor, um, is an organization that works globally to monitor political violence. The State Department and the U.S. Department of Defense use them to track political violence in other countries. We, pay part the, we the U.S. government, pays part of the salaries of this institution overseas. And this summer, the Koch Foundation, among others, paid for it to start tracking political violence in America. Um, because of the numbers being on the uptick, we were all very worried, but we didn't have a strong baseline um, and there wasn't a credible source and there's nothing more credible internationally than ACLID. And so ACLID's tracked these numbers and what they found was that the vast majority of protests were peaceful. You only had about 5% of the protests that were violent. The media has shown that quite differently and that's because violence makes for really good pictures. It's much, uh, it gets people to look when you've got pictures of, rioters and so on and balaclavas and long guns. And so if, it, if you've got, you know, a, a 10 block radius of protest and a half a block has um, bad actors in it, that's what all the media is going to be taking pictures of um, while the other protesters are taking their kids and leaving that protest. And so you get this very lopsided view from the media and ACLID has uh, a much better data standard. So first of all, there hasn't been that much violence over the summer, and that's a really good thing, given how high political tensions were rising over the summer. But second of all, you can look at various um, attempts to fact check these statements on both sides, that the 
progressives haven't condemned violence or that the right hasn't um, spoken out against it. And I was putting in there uh, one from USA Today, just as a fairly credible mainstream source uh, that does that fact checking. And so I'll drop that in there uh, as soon as I'm done talking. Um, so you can see the ACLA data and you can see those sources. Uh, the, the language is part of the problem. And so in addition to the quantitative, just how much are people talking to it, one of the things you see overseas when you see um, violence really ratcheting up is a particular form of language. And that form of language is a dehumanization of the other side, whatever that other side is. They're subhuman, they're non-human, uh, they're referred to as um, animals, but they also might be referred to as diseases and so on. Uh, all sorts of language that makes people inhuman. At the same time, they're depicted as a threat. There's language that they'll swamp us, that they want to um, harm us, that kind of thing. So dehumanization and a threat. And the third part of this unholy trinity is um, a sense that you must act to protect yourself. Only sociopaths really tend to commit violence because they enjoy violence. When violence becomes part of the body politic, it's because people feel that they're protecting their own. They feel they're protecting their women, their children, their way of life, and so on. And so when you see these three things, dehumanization, um, rhetoric of threat, and a need to protect, that is the most, vi most dangerous form of language. And you're seeing that much more from one side than the other. But, and I will say, you are seeing it from both. And you're also starting to see an acceptance of property violence on the left that can escalate um, because property moves into statues, statues are associated with identity, and so these things can escalate. So I'm trying to be factual here, but part of the facts are, are trying to accept what's happening in our society and the role of all of us, frankly, in bringing it down. We can each speak best to our own side. Um, people accept these messages best from their own side, and I think that's what we need to do. Thank you for that. Um, I guess as a follow-up, I'd like to, to sort of uh, loop Ms. Johnson into this, uh, just in the, just for the sense that uh, in the event there is post-election litigation, whether it's in the presidential race or otherwise, um, how would that how would that maybe interplay with with the public accepting uh, the results of that litigation? Yeah, I mean, I think I think one thing you always see after a very close election, unfortunately, are um, allegations of fraud. Um, and you know that that word is so heavy. I think in this context, um, you know, I think it's incorrect to say that fraud never happens. I mean, look at what happened in, in the North Carolina nine congressional election in 2018 that was completely invalidated due to confirmed, um, you know, conviction of, of fraud um, and was held again in, in 2019 as a result. So, I mean, it certainly does happen, but I think what, what happens more often is, um, you know, folks being unclear about, you know, what the law is, um, well-meaning elections officials who haven't, you know, dealt with this before or are frankly overwhelmed um, or dealing with a huge change that they weren't anticipating. And I think those those are um, more often the reasons for the um, post-election litigation that you see for canvases taking um, a very long time to complete. Um, so I think that you know any litigation that we see after any post-election activity um, will likely be most often due to those sorts of issues, which you know to your point earlier um, can create um, a lack of confidence in the election results. And I think why is one of the reasons why it's incredibly important that we continue to push back on these last minute changes that we're seeing across the country, because it, it again, it's only likely to um, create further confusion for voters, create more room for error, um, and prolong the post-election activity that, that is certainly inevitable. Um, and I think what, what we need more than ever right now is confidence in our election results. You know, whatever those are, we need to be able to know that, you know, the elections officials were working, were doing their very best um, in a very challenging environment, certainly with the spotlight shining right on them. Um, and so I think, you know, I'm really hopeful that we can get to a place where these results are, um, are clear, though I, I'm, I'm certain that there will be um, lingering post-election activity across the country for sure.
Hey, could I uh, just tack on real fast, uh, sure. Tom? This is, uh, I think this is one of the greatest reasons for preserving the Electoral College. There are arguments for and against, and I think they have merit, uh, but I think the best argument for keeping the Electoral College is it helps us localize disputes. Imagine the 2000 uh, recount had it been held nationally. If the center had been, what's the popular vote? Who's the winner? Uh, and you had a fairly narrow lead uh, by Al Gore, you have had recounts all over the country. Uh, at least if you have a state-based election system and there's no truly national election because every election is held within a state uh, pursuant to that state's laws, you can localize these disputes. Uh, and I think that's a great lesson we learned from 2000. I'm glad that we've kept that uh, system. So if we do have a really close election and, and some disputes in Michigan or Wisconsin or wherever, at least they're localized and they're not nationalized. That's a good point. Thanks for adding that. See, I, I don't see any more open questions in the Q and A. Um, you know, I'll give uh, attendance maybe thirty more seconds to see if there there are any other questions before uh, wrapping this up. See, we, we have one final question. I, I'm not really sure exactly what this means. Uh, Greg asks, what can we do? And I, I assume this means what can we do to promote confidence in the election or, or, or otherwise um, contribute to better public discourse in these issues? Well, from my perspective, volunteer to be a poll worker. Uh, We've had a demand in our state, certainly, uh, for traditional election models, including uh, people voting at the polls in person. I think that's the gold standard. Certainly, we need the absentee balloting, too, uh, but most people want to vote in person. We can't do that without poll workers. We've seen a significant drop-off in Kentucky of the poll workers who've volunteered. Most of our poll workers are senior citizens, and so naturally, they're the people most at risk from the virus. They're the least likely to want to volunteer to work the polls. Uh, so the best thing you can do is help us actually conduct the election in the first place uh, and make sure that we've got polls open for people, regardless of party. Democrats and Republicans want to vote in person uh, in many cases. That's their preference. So certainly from my perspective, that's what we really need at the state level. And let me just quickly add, we've got to deal with the KBA. We're going to see to pursue volunteer to work with polls. So specifically, this audience is an attorney a set of attorneys, you all can get CLE actually for working the polls this time. Well, that, that's a very good point. There's a, those are a little harder to come by this year. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. so that's that, that's a great point. Um, well, I, I think we are out of time now today. Uh, thank you to, to the Attorney General, to Secretary Adams, Ms. Johnson, and Dr. Kleinfeld for, for your spirited discussion today. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody again at six o'clock for our next panel on issues in constitutional law pertaining to the COVID-19 pandemic. So we'll see everybody then.